Committee on COVID-19 response, and everyone is very welcome. Sorry for that slight delay. Agenda item number one, the minutes of the proceedings of the previous meeting held on the 11th of May. Members are asked to note these minutes, which I have agreed. Members should also note the minutes of evidence from the meeting have been published on the official uh, report and is available on the committee's web page. Item uh, number two, then, is a statement from the Minister of Education. The Speaker received notification on the 22nd of June that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to make is included in your pack at page 7. I would like to welcome the Minister of Education to this meeting of the Committee. <coughs> and, uh, I would, uh, after it, there will be an opportunity uh, for questions, and I will be endeavouring that all members will have uh, an opportunity to ask the question, but to remind you that it is questions, it is not statements, and if members are succinct, they should be in also invited for supplementary. Can I remind members, I have been given the task to chair this. I have also been given a guide of approximately one hour of questions, and it is tight getting everyone to ask uh, two supplementary questions uh, within that time frame, and that's why I need your cooperation, and that's why I will bring you to a question if you are uh, prolonging your, your uh, preamble, and you may not be asked a supplementary. I would also encourage the Minister to be succinct in his answers, uh, so we all can deal with this within the time frame, and every member can ask the question. I now invite the Minister to make a statement which should be heard without interruption. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank you for this opportunity to update the Ad Hoc Committee for the third time in the work that has been undertaken in the education sector in response to COVID-19. There have been a number of important developments uh, over the past uh, weeks, and I wish to consolidate matters by making a statement today. We are now just over three months from the beginning of lockdown throughout which all areas of society have been dealing with great challenges. The issues we are facing in education have never been encountered before. An incredible amount of work has gone into the development of policies and procedures to ensure that we continue to meet the learning needs of our pupils as best we can. I would like to begin again by paying tribute to school principals, teachers, classroom assistants and indeed all those who have been working hard uh, with such dedication in the wider educational sector at this challenging time. In my previous appearances before the committee, I provided an update on a range of complex issues that have been addressed since lockdown. In recent weeks, those efforts have continued as we look to the future and put in place plans for the summer and the new school day. Whilst our response is ongoing, it is important that we begin planning for restart and recovery and a process of phased reopening of our schools in a safe and effective manner when conditions allow. Before I get on to some of the detail of these future plans, I would like to provide an update on a number of key issues. In my updates to the Committee in May, I advise members of the launch of an income support scheme for substitute teachers who have been unable to avail of any financial support through government schemes related to COVID-19. The Department launched the Income Support Scheme for Substitute Teachers on the 19th of May, with a closing date for applications of the 26th of May. I can advise that 1,650 substitute teachers uh, will receive income through the scheme in June, and the vast majority of those receive payments uh, through the DE pay run on the 16th of June. A process is also in place to take any individual special circumstances into account and where uh, applicable payments will be made through the scheme for these in the July pay run. While the full cost of the scheme will not be known until late July, the cost will be lower than anticipated, mainly as not all those who were entitled to apply for the scheme did so. Both substitute and permanent teachers uh, will also receive the two years uh, pay arrears due for the 2017-2019 uh, uh, pay settlement in the uh, June pay run. Mr Speaker, on the 16th of April, I set out the details of the alternative arrangements uh, for awarding GCSE, AS and A-level qualifications. These arrangements placed a high degree of trust in our teaching profession, and I know teachers were very aware of their responsibility towards their pupils. Uh, despite the enormity of the tasks, school met the tight deadlines set for submitting the um, 
the centre assessed grades to the Council uh, for the curriculum examinations and assessment. These data are now going through a process of standardisation to ensure that the final outcomes are as fair as well as robust. While there is still some way to go through various stages of checking and validation, CCEA is on track to have results issued in the uh, original published dates in August for all pupils, including private candidates. I want to thank every teacher and school leader involved in this process. Uh, this has been an enormous challenge, and I am very proud of the way that our teachers rose to that challenge to ensure their students will be able to progress to the next stage of their, of their lives in September. Well, work, uh, the work on, on awarding this year has been progressing. My department has commissioned CCEA to bring forward proposals for examinations in the next exam, exam, uh, academic year. If anything, given the opportunity uncertainty surrounding the public health situation, this is an even more complex planning process than the arrangements for this year. Account needs to be taken of the impact of lost teaching time on students, as well as considering the impact of any restrictions on teaching and assessment arrangements in the next academic year. For example, how will social distancing impact on different types of assessments that make up qualifications, and what adjustments, if any, can be made without impacting the integrity and therefore the value of those qualifications? Uh, the work will carry on over the summer, and more information will be made available at the earliest opportunity. However, while the work is still being progressed, the starting point is that, that exams are the best, fairest and most accurate way of awarding qualifications. So every effort must be made to make sure exams take place. CCEA is progressing plans for the normal November exam series, taking account of the evolving public health guidance. This series involves only a small cohort of, of pupils, uh, normally those taking GCSE single and double award science. So we will provide an opportunity to monitor any adaptations to exam arrangements. Any lessons that can be drawn from this exam series will be used to further refine the planning for the remaining series in 2021. Earlier this week, I published guidance for schools on curriculum planning for the 2021 uh, academic year. The guidance provides advice and support for schools as they consider how to tailor and adapt delivery of the curriculum to support recovery when pupils return for the new academic year. My department has also commissioned CCEA and ETI uh, to provide further guidance to schools on effective ways in which the curriculum could be planned for, implemented and assessed in the new academic year. These guidance do documents will set out ways in which existing resources can be used to support remote and blended learning approaches and provide exemplars of uh, current practice and resources that schools can adapt uh, to reflect their circumstances. This guidance will add to the wide range of resources which have been uh, collated, developed and disseminated to su uh, support school leaders and teachers over the period of the pandemic. We are currently fortunate that the Northern Ireland curriculum is specifically designed to be adaptable and dynamic, and is therefore the ideal scaffold to support and underpin teaching and, learn, uh, and learning. Limited, provision, sorry, limited prescription gives schools flexibility to choose what to teach, for how long and how often, and to use the approaches that best suit their pupils. The key message across the system is that the aim for 2021 is to support pupils to be motivated to learn and to become competent and independent learners through a curriculum that gives equal emphasis to knowledge, understanding and skills. I want to thank all those teachers and staff who are working so hard to ensure our pupils are supported at this time and hope that they will find the guidance that has been provided by the Department and our delivery partners helpful in supporting their planning. In my previous uh, statement to the Committee, I advised of the £12 million emergency package for childcare provision for key workers and the associated establishment of the childcare support scheme. Application forms were issued to both open and closed daycare and school-aged childcare settings on the 6th of, of May. Application forms for the approved uh, home childcare, uh, childcare scheme and support for childminders were issued on the 7th of May. In order to allow the maximum opportunity for applicants to be uh, received, the closing date for applications for closed settings was extended until the 12th of June. Funding for the current COVID-19 childcare support scheme ends on the 30th of June, and demand for childcare and expenditure across uh, all elements of the scheme are being monitored in line with the available budget. The amounts actually paid out under childcare scheme are determined by the volume and nature of the applications that are submitted by the sector and by the assessment of eligible costs. Despite support being put in place to assist applicants uh, and the closing date being extended, only 46% of closed settings applied. 
The Department of Health and Education continue uh, to work with the Childcare Reference Group on the reasons for the smaller than expected number of applicants uh, received. Initial findings suggest that many settings were in seat of financial support, support from other sources. A number of, of applications are still uh, to be processed for the period in April and May, in addition to the payments for June. So this amount will increase over coming weeks. I will come to plans for, child, for the childcare sector uh, recovery later in my statement. Turning to arrangements for the summer period and beyond, the current arrangements for educational supervision in schools for vulnerable children and children of key workers will end on the 30th of June, and support for vulnerable children and children of key workers will need to be reshaped for the summer. I am grateful for the support uh, and provision provided by teachers and principals since the 23rd of March 2020, when schools in Northern Ireland closed for all children except for children deemed vulnerable and the children of key workers. Teachers and principals deserve a break over the summer, and we are therefore looking at alternative support mechanisms. The well-being of children and young people remains our primary concern, and I recognise that certain groups uh, may continue to need support during the summer months. But with the focus shifting from educational to play and leisure activities for vulnerable children and the children of key workers. To mitigate the impact of ending the emergency educational scheme, I have gained the Executive's agreement to a number of measures which could support summer activity for these children and young people. I can confirm that the Education Authority is currently working on a number of special, with a number of special schools to make summer provision for 2020. It should be noted that this will not be in the usual format of previous years, given the impact of the pandemic. Uh, the EA is working in partnership with special schools to provide ideas and activities uh, online for pupils and also some tailored uh, school-based summer schemes. The EA will provide um, further details shortly. A low generic non-targeted uh, youth work provision ceased in March. The Education Authority and youth organisations have worked closely to ensure the needs of vulnerable children and young people continue to be addressed. Statutory Youth Service will continue to provide support to vulnerable young people as part of the ongoing response. In addition to existing report, uh, support, Statutory Youth Services will provide some additional small group work, along with some further targeted outreach and detached work. Uh, there is now an opportunity for voluntary uh, sector youth providers, uniformed organisations and private sector providers to deliver uh, limited summer uh, programmes prioritising key workers aged 9 to 13 that are consistent with public health restrictions that are in place. This will complement existing online youth services. Many, youth, uh, many voluntary youth workers funded by the Education Authority are maintaining contact with their members online and developing creative solutions to deliver the curriculum, for example, uh, in the creative sense. It is anticipated that this will continue during July and August. Feedback from the Youth Centre indicates that youth workers are keen to support young people over the summer. We recognise that there are associated issues with adherence to public health guidance, training of volunteers and staff to ensure uh, compliance, individual uh, personal concerns for some staff and volunteers, and having appropriate insurance cover. Departmental guidance for safe working in all educational settings in Northern Ireland was issued by the Department on the 4th of June. This has been shared with the youth uh, sector and will be made available to um, all involved in the running of summer schemes. Work was also com uh, commenced to develop additional specific youth guidance. The provision of summer programmes will be conditional upon compliance with uh, Department of Education safe work uh, guidance and the relevant permissions um, in respect of executive the five-stage uh, recovery plan. The disruption to our children's learning caused by COVID-19 cannot be overestimated. Uh, and I'm considering how to bring forward uh, projects to support learning for children over the summer and indeed beyond. I, I will also bring forward, uh, I brought forward a project called Engage to provide literacy and numeracy support, uh, mental uh, health interventions and the widening of nurture support for the 2021 academic year in socially deprived areas. I would like now to turn to the issue of free school meals, which have been the subject of considerable recent public debate, particularly in relation to concerns that some children will go hungry over the summer period. Uh, direct payments in lieu of free school meals are scheduled to cease on the 30th of June. Subject to availability of funding, the Executive has agreed that a similar but separate uh, summer food scheme would be established to alleviate um, hardship over the summer months for the families of children entitled to free school meals uh, direct payments. Details on how the scheme will be delivered are being finalised and will be published shortly. 
In addition, I plan to extend and expand the Education Authority's Eat Well, Live Well programme to provide healthy breakfasts and lunches to around 5,000 vulnerable uh, young people. Mr Deputy Speaker, the provision of home to school transport in September will be an extremely complex and challenging area of work. So any form of, of social distancing will have an impact on the ability of the Education Authority to transport all children to school by bus or by taxi. The Education Authority is making every effort to maximise uh, the number of children that can be safely uh, transported. However, if any restrictions remain in place in social distancing, there is likely to be a substantial shortfall between the number of pupils who are eligible for home to school transport and the number of, of places available on vehicles. And that impact will uh, undoubtedly be likely to be felt across all school sectors. So I'm currently looking at all options that could help mitigate the disruption that will be caused for many families. And my officials and those of the Education Authority are working tirelessly with a range of key stakeholders on this issue. Mr Speaker, childcare is a key priority within the education restart. And as well as being of the utmost importance in enabling parents to get back to work, get into the working environment, a paper on childcare sector recovery planning was discussed and agreed by the Executive on the 18th of June. The childcare recovery uh, plan aims to restore the childcare sector to pre-COVID-19 capacity levels as quickly and as safely as possible. The aim of the plan is to ensure that parents can access childcare uh, as and when they need it over the next few months. The widening of the key worker definition on the 8th of June and further on the 16th of June has been the first step in reopening of the sector. In addition, in recognition of the need for childcare provision to align with the executive decision making in relation to parents being able to return to work, from the, def from the 29th of June, the definition of key worker will no longer uh, apply for access to childcare, so it will be open to everyone. This will assess, assist in the return to full capacity by enabling more providers to reopen, more parents to access registered, chi uh, registered childcare. Childminders can care for children for four families in July and from August, uh, five families. There is no minimum or maximum number that a childcare setting can accommodate. However, childcare providers must adhere to the Department of Health's COVID guidance, which sets out the expectations on providers in terms of adherence to public health and infection control advice. For childcare settings, the guidance makes it clear that uh, children should be cared for, uh, from, for within uh, play pods of up to 12 children, and pods should be kept apart. The layout of, of play pod should comply with the minimum space per child requirements in the minimum standards. This would mean that some settings will not be able to operate at full capacity, although that will depend upon how they organise the setting and the extent to which they can maximise the use of outdoor space. The childcare recovery uh, plan includes financial support for childcare providers to reopen. Further funding will be subject to an executive agreement, and the detail of a funding support scheme is being developed. In childcare terms, the announcement uh, by the executive on the 22nd of June, allowing up to six people meeting indoors will provide some flexibilities for families to access childcare support from another family member or a friend, and thus provide informal childcare provision. Uh, Mr Speaker, we are all too aware of the stresses felt by our teachers, our parents and our pupils due to the ongoing disruption and uncertainty regarding the future. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented significant challenges right across society and has been particularly difficult for children and young people, parents and carers and the education workforce. About half our schools have remained, uh, remained open for children of key workers and vulnerable children, although, as in other parts of the UK, the numbers of vulnerable children has been low. Many of these children particularly benefit from the structured support of a school setting away from uh, often a challenging home environment, which is why supporting such children has been a key priority. We won't know the final impact of the current crisis on children's safety, well-being and learning at this stage, but it is clear that the longer children remain out of school, the slower recovery of lost learning. My strategic objective is to see the full-time resumption of classroom-based learning for all pupils as soon as possible when it is safe to do so. Education is of vital importance for our children and our young people, not only in terms of their lifelong opportunities, but also for their emotional well-being and, uh, and development, and for the fabric of wider society, including the economy. My department is working on a restart programme which focuses on physical protection, well-being, vulnerable learners and special educational needs uh, services, 
standards in learning, the new school day and childcare. Education restarts involves significant collaboration and co-design, and there is ongoing engagement with school principals, trade unions, managing authorities and sectoral bodies uh, representing the various school sectors, parenting organisations and children and young people. Education Restart is also supported by the Public Health Agency and the Department of Health. Education recovery planning is, is currently based on the broad assumption that the education system will not be able to return to business as usual from day one. An immediate priority is therefore the development of strategic guidance for practical arrangements for the safe reopening of schools in August. I want to place on record my appreciation for the work of the practitioners group, which has worked tirelessly to co-design the new school day framework guidance by which schools will plan reopening. The group delivered finalised guidance, which was considered and endorsed by the executive on the 18th of June, published on the 19th of June, representing a significant step forward in the process of planning for the safe reopening of schools. The guidance is day one focus and will be supplemented by a range of additional operational guidance papers covering a wide range of matters such as transport, catering, uh, curriculum and early years arrangements. I want to make an important clarification arising from the executive's endorsements on the guidance and the social distancing assumptions under which planning for reopening schools will be uh, planned. The decision of the executive was that schools should take a planning assumption of two metres social distancing among adults and between adults and the pupils they are working with and one metre between pupils, uh, which can and should, where possible, be, uh, be further mitigated by use of, the, of protective bubbles, in essentially, uh, in essence, contained consistent groups of pupils uh, kept together to limit transmissions and movements within school settings. The executive has decided that the one metre social distancing assumption will apply to all year groups within a school setting up to year 14 inclusive. The practitioner group has reflected on the executive's decision and acknowledged that while protective bubbles will not be applied to years 11 to 14, the reduced in instances of contact um, across the whole school through use of a bubble strategy in years to 8 to 10 would be a mitigating factor against transmission and would therefore provide appropriate rationale for applying one metre distancing across all year groups. I am grateful to the group for the professional um, insight they have brought uh, in to the consideration of this matter. Um, and, uh, and how, a, from a practical perspective, it will assist with uh, their planning decisions. I am conscious, uh, uh, conscious that every school building and every classroom is different. Therefore, the guidance is not prescriptive. School leaders will be best placed to consider the guidance and implement them based upon their own circumstances. We are all aware of the challenges of physical distancing. These challenges are particularly acute within educational settings. The ongoing need for physical distancing will impact on high school returns in terms of classes, sizes, attendance pattern, kidding arrangements and school day structure. Of course, these measures are designed to be deployed when schools return in August and September and will need to be reviewed in advance of the new school term to ensure that they align with the wider public health position at that point. In all of our work, we continue to be guided by the medical and scientific arrangements. We do remain in a fluid situation. My overriding aim remains a full return for every pupil to classroom learning full time. The restart arrangements that I have outlined reflect the current position, but my hope remains that if the wider public health situation continues to improve, further decisions will be able to be taken before the start of the new term to enable schools to resume uh, classroom teaching for all students full time, subject to protections to mitigate risk and to protect uh, public health. In closing, Mr Speaker, the challenges we are dealing with in education are unprecedented. Although our overall approach to managing the COVID-19 virus uh, must rightly remain cautious, the work towards education restart is a positive step in our wider recovery. I would like to thank again all school leaders, teachers, non-teaching staff and parents for their continued work to support not just our vulnerable people and the children of key workers, but the tens of thousands of pupils in our education system. I thank the Minister for his statement and there will now be a period of approximately an hour for questions. I remind members what I said at the start of the meeting that uh, in asking a question it should not be pre pre prefaced, prefaced by at their question with a speech or a statement. They should be succinct, particularly if you wish to ask the supplementary question. You should be aiming 
for a single sentence question and introduction uh, if you wish to ask a supplementary question. And again, I encourage the Minister to be concise. And I call the Chair of the Committee for Education, Chris Little, who as normal will be given a little bit more latitude. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I also thank the teaching, non-teaching staff, parents and pupils across Northern Ireland for their leadership and hard work during this public health emergency. As of today, there are 600 children in Northern Ireland waiting longer than the statutory limit of six months for a statement of special educational need. There are 285 children with statements of special educational need who do not yet have a school place for September 2020. 156 of those children are without a place in a special school. Mr. Speaker, these, Deputy Speaker, these are some of the most vulnerable children in our community. The children, their families, their schools in this assembly demand to know what specific action the Education Minister has taken to arrest the dysfunctionality of special educational needs statementing and area planning that is failing children with special educational needs in Northern Ireland. I thank the member for his question. The figures that he's outlined, I think, are unacceptable. It is clear that given the um, assessment that was done and the inquiry that was done um, into the Education Authority produced a range of recommendations which showed that there was a level of dysfunctionality within the Education Authority in relation to special educational needs. Uh, those are being implemented. I think there has been a level of delay because of the COVID situation. But as part of that, uh, while ultimately a lot of this is internal to the EA, we are keeping a close monitoring arrangement on that and ensuring, for instance, that there is a representative of the department, indeed, in any implementation board. But it is also, uh, those are, if you like, call it the systemic issues which need to be tackled, uh, particularly in the short to medium term. There's also then the very specific issue of the unplaced children. And today my officials have been meeting with, uh, the executive have been on at the same time, but the, my officials have been meeting with the uh, Education Authority to discuss the issue. Uh, we expect to see progress on that. And indeed for each individual family within that, it creates an enormous level of burden and uncertainty. And so this is something which does need to be tackled as quickly as possible and as thoroughly as possible, because it's unacceptable that any child is left without a school place. Chris Little for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Given the dysfunction of the special education statement in and area planning processes, does the Minister accept that his suspension of the independent review of education was wrong and that it must be restarted immediately? With respect, I have not suspended the independent review of education. The position in terms of that, and perhaps the member should, should check his facts in relation to that, the position is that it, as well as the independent panel, on, uh, that are part of the NDNA commitments, which we are progressing. There is budget in, uh, in line with those. But to establish those will require a level of, um, for example, there will be actually have to establish who the membership of that will be, what the terms of reference will be. Everything, and indeed the approach that's been taken by the executive as a whole, has been to focus in everything it can on the COVID situation. Those issues will be, uh, will be progressed as quickly as possible and as soon as possible, but there's been no suspension of anyone, and it would be misleading to give the impression that, that it has been suspended. I call William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for a statement to the House today, and I, I too, on behalf of my party, thank the principals, teachers, auxiliary staff, uh, and parents, and not least children, for their forebodings over the last period during the COVID-19 situation. Can I ask the Minister, in relation to uh, youth work, voluntary youth work, he says in the statement, youth workers are keen to support young people over the summer. I raised this issue yesterday at the Education Committee with the Permanent Secretary of your department and with the Chief Executive of the Education Authority. Can I implore the Minister and those involved in education, particularly the youth service, uh, in Can the member finalise this question? In relation to uh, interface work and, and uh, the areas like North Belfast, that that work would continue over the summer to alleviate problems and pressures at interfaces? Yes, it would be. I think very specifically, I don't think it was directly mentioned in the statement, particularly working, for instance, with uh, communities, we're working with DOJ, working with the police in particular, that where we're seeing. Um, in interface areas where we're seeing sort of at-risk children, that those actually are very much at the forefront of the interventions of, of your service. And those sort of programmes, um, it has been worked on a multi-agency basis to ensure that those programmes continue throughout the summer. Now that's, 
in addition to whatever uh, wider youth work is done throughout the summer, but certainly there will be a focus within that. And I've, there's been a discussion at, at various sort of departmental levels to ensure that that progresses. I call Karen Mullen. Minister, thank you for your statement. And I also want to pay tribute to teaching, non teaching staff, parents, guardians, and young people at this time. Uh, further to the member's question across the, the chamber about youth provision, you have given an update this week and you have given an update in your statement, but youth settings are still, particularly community and voluntary, awaiting guidance. Um, they have not received the update. Can the Minister let us know uh, what it, to, they should expect that guidance? Well, as part of that, which was, I think, suggested at the executive, indeed, in terms of dealing with the paper, uh, I think it is also helpful we are moving towards a uh, youth sector sort of reference group, which would mirror, I suppose, similar to what is there in terms of the uh, childcare reference group, which, indeed, I think, particularly a number, as well as youth workers themselves, there is a range of agencies will be involved with. The idea would be to have uh, guidance which is available not simply to those who are directly doing youth work through EA, but it is also critical that um, I think there is a very big role, particularly for voluntary community sector, for private organisations, for uniformed organisations, for church groups that are seeking to do over the summer, that there is that permissibility, but that it is done, if you like, in, in connection with the guidance. Uh, the EA will act, I think, as a signpost for that, but also to make sure that any group that is doing any level of organisation is given that, that level of guidance. I call Karen Mullen. Thank you. Um, uh, Minister, also welcome that teachers and sub-teachers received their two-year pay accrual in uh, the June payroll. Just wanted to ask in relation to plans for sub-teachers for September, is there a plan in place and also funding to allow schools to employ extra sub-teachers and classroom assistants to allow you to get as many children back into the classroom given the social distancing? If there is an issue where we can uh, operate to face any sort of additional costs that would arise out of a, a restart, that would be met by the department. I think that would be very clear. Uh, it is also the case that I think that in terms of substitute teachers, uh, you know, they will play a role where we are in a position that there is, um, for example, where we have teachers that are all sick, that they can, uh, they can make use of that as well. On it. Look, as I indicated and probably made it very clear, uh, we're preparing up, if you like, for the scenario in which we try and maximise that. But I'd be very hopeful that we can reach a situation where we can actually move to a point where every child is in, where we can actually find a slightly different uh, formula. Because there's a range of mitigation measures that are already in place as a result of the guidance, which apply to some extent whether you have schools that are 50% full, 80% full, or 100% full. So I would be very hopeful that we can move uh, towards that. I think there will also potentially be a key role for substitute teachers if there is the acceptance of the, of the funding of the Engage programme, which, uh, while it will not maybe be the exact same nature, but, for example, members will, be, will remember the um, signature projects that were done a, a number of years ago, which were very successful. Um, and I think that there will be a key role as we're looking to widen the number of those that would be involved within the education system that substitute teachers would also be some would be people who would be very applicable uh, to that as well. I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your statement. Minister, if when the GCSE and A-level grades are sent out to parents, there is significant discontent among parents and schools because C is untested on an unbenchmark model uh, has changed the moderated grades awarded through teacher professional judgment. This is largely unchallengeable. Are you simply going to tell everyone to suck it up and make the best of it, or do you have an alternative plan? Well, wouldn't exactly uh, the vernacular the member uses would not be the, what I would uh, say in relation. There, there does need to be clearly, while the basis of the grades is uh, the assessment that is made by individual teachers, there's got to be a level of moderation between centres. You cannot have a situation where one school, and it is the same, it is part of human nature, uh, that where you get two or more people, if for, and for example, we take a different example of an interview situation where you and I could be sitting on a panel, we may both decide. That's uh, who the best candidate is, but you may be scoring that person 80%, I may be scoring them 60% because our assessment in terms of the way one is a hard marker and wasn't, one isn't. So there has to be a level of, from a point of view of fairness, there has to be a level of um, centre assessment, and that is something I think which will apply across the board, uh, across different jurisdictions, if, if grades are simply being uh, awarded on that basis. Otherwise, there would not be the level of robustness and fairness within the system to ensure then that we have a reasonable position for all students. I call Daniel McCrossan for a supplement. 
Uh, thank you, Minister, for your answer to that question. Minister, can post primary schools be assured that decisions around the cont content of GCSE and AS and A level curriculum and what exams, if any, will go ahead in the 2020 uh, 2021 academic year will be made well before the schools return in September so that teachers can prepare for learning and teaching. And I note in your statement, Minister, you have said that uh, normal exams will resume in November. How can it be normal when this has been a very abnormal year and children have been out of school since March, Minister? Normality is on the basis of, uh, of the eye of the beholder in relation to that. What I am saying is that the intention is to hold – normally there would be exams of a small number that would normally take place in November. The, the intention is for those to go ahead. Um, as we sort of scope ahead, it is likely, and I think the flexibility of the No Land curriculum allows this, uh, that uh, there will be a pairing down to basics in terms of the curriculum. What we need to do is not only get that detailed advice of CCA, but to be fair, I think in terms of the broader um, advice that can be given in terms of the curriculum, and this is particularly true of public examinations at GCSE, at AS level and A level, We've also got to take into cognizance that uh, it is not simply Northern Ireland Board through CCA that's delivering this. We need to ensure that, particularly where there's competition between different jurisdictions, that that is on a relatively level playing field, uh, so that, above all else, that none of our pupils are disadvantaged. But it is clear, and I think there's got to be a, an expectation of parents, given the circumstances that are there, uh, that what can be deliverable through the curriculum in the autumn of 2020 will not necessarily be the same as was there in 2019 or 2018. And there will need to be uh, a certain level of, of expectation management uh, as well. But the aim is to provide as broad a curriculum as, as possible. Um, where there needs to be things brought down to basics, they, they will be. And the flexibility that we have within our curriculum, which is not overtly prescriptive, I think enables, us, enables that to happen. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister. Can I just double check in terms of summer schemes or summer schools that take place on a school campus that they can go ahead, including those organised from within the private sector? There is no particular problem with that. The only issue around anything with summer schemes will be compliance with public uh, health guidance, so that if, from the public health agency, they put a limitation in terms of numbers on a use of space, for example, that will also apply, and that guidance will be there. But the idea is that provided people uh, fulfil public health guidance and indeed therefore do not step outside the regulations that, that are there. There is permissibility uh, for those schemes to go ahead. And I think that was critical because whatever can be done from the broad statutory um, settings will take us so far. But I think there is a strong opportunity, I think a, a desire out there amongst many communities, amongst voluntary organisations, amongst private settings to be able to provide that release for our young people many of whom have been left in a very, very difficult situation since March. And it's important that, in terms of that release, that it's, it's managed and controlled. And I think we've seen, perhaps, at, at one end of the scale in recent weeks at times, where simply there's been, at times, very, very large gatherings of young people, which I think are not, not helpful. We've also, I should say, and I want to pay tribute, seen countless examples of the great work that young people have done throughout this, particularly, for instance, in providing support to the elderly in, in a whole range of ways. And I want to pay tribute to a lot of our, our young people. But we need to ensure that that necessary release of tension that is there that can happen over the summer is done in a managed and controlled way. And I think there's a key role for voluntary, uniformed organisations and private providers to be able to, to do that. I thank the Minister. Just two specifics, if I may. Is the social distance indoor and outdoor still at two metres? And is the maximum group size, including an adult supervising or mentoring, uh, the number 10? Well, on the basis of what uh, that is, we're not quite at the, the start of the summer. And uh, issues around social distancing, around the regulations, are an evolving situation. It will be, I suppose, that to ensure that what is there is compatible at, at the time. And again, as we are in a, a fluid situation, that might be something that, that may end up moving sort of uh, in terms of a level of easement that is there. I think it is important that, that what is compatible is that what is done is compatible with what the time frame is for the particular venture to take place. At the moment, I think that in terms of levels of easements, that is going in one direction. So I think anybody can assume that the, the most restrictive they are likely to be over the summer is where we are today. I call Paula Bradley. Um, thank the Minister. Minister, in your statement, you talk about a project called Engage. Um, could you go into a little bit more detail on that when that's due well, to start? The, the aim is, I suppose, to look at we're looking at a number of things which could be smaller interventions over the summer in terms of learning. It is undoubtedly the case um, that 
whatever the great work that has been done in terms of remote learning, there will be a level of loss of continuity of learning. Now, there's a wider group within the department looking at that issue of continuity of learning. But it is clear that we need to have a very focused, tailored piece of work that will stretch over most of the next academic year, where that support can be put in place that is particularly focused, given the constraint on resources, um, into areas, schools where there is levels of social deprivation in particular, to provide, because there is, I think, undoubtedly a concern that often those who are in socially deprived areas will have suffered most because of the lockdown, maybe lost opportunities. Uh, and it's critical that we have that focused level of intervention. Um, the exact nature of that will focus, I think, principally on numeracy and literacy, but other areas of catch-up. Um, and the detail of that, I think, is being scoped out with experts, uh, with the likes of ETI, with teachers at present, so that we can actually have a full scheme which, assuming that there is funding for it, can then kick in um, early into the new academic, um, academic year. And I think that that can make a major impact in terms of being able to bridge some of the gap that has been there in terms of the potential lost learning that we faced um, during the, uh, the summer or the spring months of this year. I call Paula Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister uh, for his answer. Can I then just follow on and ask the Minister, um, how up to date um, is, your, is the definition of socially deprived among the department? I mean, I represent North Belfast that can go from one end of the scale to the other and lots of pocketed areas of social deprivation, and quite often identified need is not identified. So it's just asking, um, you know, in the broader right. sense, I suppose, can other people be brought into this that aren't recognised to be in a social I think, I think, I think from that point of view, we want to look to try and get the best possible definition to ensure that resources are most uh, targeted. You know, we're looking at a scheme um, which would be significant in its, in its ambitions in that regard, um, and as such, uh, we want to make sure that it's, it can be relatively widely drawn to be able to provide that level of support. I call Catherine Kelly. Minister, given the underspend in relation to the child care support scheme, can you ensure that any new financial support package is less complex in order for providers to reopen their doors and support parents returning to work? I think there's been a few problems in terms of that. You're right in terms of I think it's that we need to ensure that whatever is put forward by education and health and indeed administered is less complex in its nature. I think the other issue, um, and so therefore Moving forward, I think there are lessons to be learned from the, the scheme. It is undoubtedly the case, though, also as well, that um, there has been a number of call it catch-22 situations, one of which has been that, um, that in terms of the support that is available, particularly the childcare settings, has come from a number of different sources. And therefore, effectively, that level of support perhaps has been available, but has actually been drawn down in a different way. So that has been significant. There has also been issues ranged which, in terms of the turnaround of speed um, from the regulatory point of view from the Department of Health and by Health Trust. Uh, there has been then, I think, a commitment from the Department of Health for that to happen in a much quicker manner. But I think the critical issue is a level, I think, of alignment of supply and demand, because you can provide all the support in the world to a setting to be open. If it is then so heavily restricted in terms of the numbers that it can provide, that is not something which is sustainable, which is why First of all, the widening of key worker definition and now the movement to effectively make that open across the board, um, I think is critical as well. I think it is also important that while public health is, is vital to this, that in terms of any restrictions that are applied uh, in terms of from a practical point of view on the ground are of a level which in terms of numbers are sustainable to enable uh, those settings to um, reopen on that basis. And it is about trying to ensure that there is that alignment between supply and demand. One of the other side where there will be some level of impact on that, I suspect, is given that, that we are likely to come out of this with higher levels of unemployment, for some families who would maybe normally choose childcare, um, their option may well be they would see the more practical option of the child remaining at home during, during that period. Uh, and I think there is also an interlinkage with school, uh, with school openings as well. Call Catherine Kelly for supplementary. Thank you for your response, Minister. Can I ask that you ensure the community and voluntary sector who provide preschool education in our local communities are included in any new support package as they were not eligible to, to apply for the previous scheme? 
Well, certainly, I will raise that point. I mean, the, the package itself is not one that is entirely within uh, my gift. It is one that uh, will have to be, first of all, signed off by the Department of Finance. But principally, in terms of some of the regulatory side of it, much of that lies with the Department of Health. But I would be happy to work with colleagues to ensure that that point is uh, borne in mind as we move ahead. I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, can you assure us that rural country schools are invaluable going forward, and in most cases there is more available room for working at the required distances, therefore making for safer working conditions for pupils and teachers alike? Well, I, I, certainly, I mean, and I had the opportunity to visit, for instance, a, um, a rural primary school yesterday, um, for example, and it is the case that one of the levels of complexity around uh, what is doable is a combination, if you like, of the physical size of the classes, but also the number of pupils that, that are there. And it, it tends to be that a number of the smaller schools, particularly in a rural setting, are probably better placed to have uh, a full level of return, even on the basis of social distancing. Now, I think, as I said, I would reiterate that it is important that our aim is actually to reach a point in which we can provide safe provision for everybody to be back all the time. And I think that would be a goal which I would like to feel that we are moving towards as we move towards the, uh, towards the new year, sorry, towards the new academic year. But obviously, as part of this, we need to plan for a range of different uh, scenarios. But certainly, I think for a lot of rural schools, I think they are quite well placed, particularly at primary level, to be able to do that. I call Harry Harvey for supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you, Minister, for your answer. Can the Minister assure us that the necessary funding will be available for rural schools for this reason? Thank you. I don't want to create a great turf war between um, rural schools, urban schools, uh, or indeed those in a suburban area. Um, or I think the Honourable Member, particularly from North Down, would be um, uh, growling at me at that, at that point. Uh, look, it is the case that where, where there's additional um, resource implications where it is necessary to be done to help reopen schools, those will be met. You know, be it around issues around deep cleans, be it issues around the level of PPE that will be required, uh, or indeed sort of a range of those, those type of issues. And we work as well, I think, given probably some of the pressures that are there on the resource budget, uh, where there's additional money that is needed to be supported from the executive, I'll work with executive colleagues to try to uh, see if that can be found, and also to see what within the system be, can be capitalised, because the, the pressure on capital funding is likely in the short term to be uh, less of a pressure on the resource side of it. So, uh, you know, I would be confident that, that we can give that assurance to schools that, in terms of the reopening, uh, that whatever funds are needed to be able to get them to reopen uh, will be met centrally. I call Philip McGuigan. Uh, last Ken Collier. Uh, obviously, blended learning is a new and sudden phenomenon for teachers, uh, school children, and parents alike as a result of COVID. Uh, and it's something that's likely, you know, despite the Minister's objective, uh, ultimately of getting all children back, blended learning is something that's likely to continue. I mean, he's alluded in a statement about guidance. Can I ask when that guidance is likely to be made available? There has been, I suppose, already guidance given out in terms of remote learning. And I know that, for example, having visited a number of schools yesterday, a lot of the work in terms of remote learning, which forms, if you like, the other side uh, within blended learning, is already being developed uh, and supported. Uh, what I would say, I mean, look, the member makes, I think, a very valid point um, in terms of the necessity for some level of blended learning. Because even if we're in a position come August and September to say, here's a route to which, largely speaking, we can get everybody back in. There will also be a minority of children that, perhaps because of their condition, because of a particular vulnerability, that it may in the short term not be suitable for them to be in school, either sort of short term, or you know, all week, or alternatively, it may be because of their particular condition that actually they, they may need a little level of additional protection and therefore have to work from, from home. So I think there will be a necessity for that level of remote learning and blended learning, no matter what. I think having been thrown into a situation in which this was entirely unprecedented in March, I think there has been a lot of work done. There's been a lot of thinking that has gone on by, by schools. And I've been, uh, for example, I'm not, maybe not naming the school, but I was at a school yesterday where a presentation was done on the various elements of preparation they had done, including in terms of remote learning. Um, and it is remarkable the amount of work that has been put in and the quality of the work that has been put in. But I think everybody will still accept 
that any level of blended learning, any level of remote learning, is at best a form of substitute for that classroom teaching. And I think everybody, I think, will share the view that we want as soon as possible to get uh, children back into the, into the classroom, back into, if not quite exactly a normal routine, but at the very least, something which means that they are five days a week in, in school. I call Philip McGuigan for supplement. Uh, Elgott, and I just want to echo the Minister's uh, uh, praise for the good work that has been done within schools uh, and for parents in terms of blended learning. I mean, in terms of the guidance, is it likely that there will be any additional training or practical support uh, additional to that offer? I think, I think from that point of view, any support that is needed can be provided on that basis. Uh, I mean, uh, training is probably a little bit more of a difficult thing at, at times because the normal methodology of training will not be actually, by definition, getting large numbers of people into the into the one hall or the one room to do that. So, but uh, there are sort of resources there and there can be that level of support. I mean, it's also important that in terms of both the monitoring of it and the support throughout this, this uh, crisis, every school has had a link officer appointed to it, uh, either through EA or ETI, to provide that level of support. So it is a, a case that a school is not, in that sense, less, left isolated. It has that uh, route of information, that route of help that, that can be provided. And if there are specific... Um, examples where a school needs that level of additional help and support, or indeed if they can, on the flip side of the coin, if they have innovative practices which I think are worthy of sharing, I think that that is also something which should be um, put out through the, the system. Because I think um, one of the, the positives of this um, very major crisis has been a number of schools have actually come up with very, very innovative ways of doing things, of thinking of things. And I think even when we get past the, the COVID crisis, I think there are lessons to be learned which can actually lead to uh, better teaching methods, better ways of doing things. Um, and so, you know, there is always some positive then to be, to be taken out of what is a, a very terrible and unprecedented overall position. I call Justin McNulty. Gura May, Yogurt, Last Crown Caller. Minister, can you pay a tribute along with myself to the multitasking parents out there who have been juggling their careers and their homeschooling and a, a, a regular occurrence of this pandemic, a, a ray of sunshine in the gloom of this pandemic has been the children gate crashing um, Zoom calls and Zoom meetings. It's been wonderful. But on a much more serious note, Minister, you said that direct payments in lieu of school meals, free school meals are scheduled to cease on the 30th of June 2020. That's just over four days away, subject to availability of funding. Are you saying that from Tuesday, children could potentially go hungry? No, because the issue in terms of that is, that technically speaking, the VARES for a, the free school meal payments is linked in directly with the, the school year. So there will be a different route that will be taken. There is, look, there is common consensus and common agreement amongst all the parties in terms of the need for those payments to continue. Uh, Given that, that, in terms of the timing of those, uh, methodology would, would be probably slightly differently over the summer anyway. You'd probably be looking at a payment in July and a payment in August that will cover the, the full period. Um, I think there is, there is no particular political disagreement over this. This is something that everybody is on the same page. And the range of families that we support and the level that is supported in Northern Ireland um, should do Northern Ireland proud because it actually is on a much more extensive level uh, than what is happening elsewhere. So, for example, we estimate that the level of support that will be provided over the summer is around about 12, 12 and a half million in terms of uh, the cohort of the 100,000, roughly, of um, children that this impacts in. If you compare that with England, which is 30 times the size of Northern Ireland in terms of population, over the summer they will be providing a maximum of around 120 million. So there's a much greater level of support. It is also the case that, that, as indicated, for those who are most vulnerable, uh, again, we are looking to support the uh, Eat Well, Live Well campaign, which covers 5,000 of the most vulnerable children, not as an alternative to free school meals, but as an addition to that. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister and teaching staff for their hard work throughout this pandemic. I welcome the clarity via the Minister's statement regarding the desire for a full-time educational provision in September. The decision to move from one metre uh, distance, social distancing is key to this happening, albeit it still has its problems. Can the Minister outline his rationale behind this move? Well, in terms of, I should say, um, first of all, I maybe should, I, 
omitted to mention probably after the, the last question, I would join uh, with the Honourable Member for um, Nuri and Armagh in also paying tribute, I think, to the hard work that parents have done throughout this, this process and juggling and multitasking uh, where possible. Uh, in terms of the rationale of the move, this was something that was very carefully considered. Um, there were discussions with PHA, with Department of Health, and in terms of the guidance, um, we worked very closely alongside them. It, it is abundantly clear that the, uh, the level of risk, certainly in terms of illness or serious illness to children, is at a much, much lesser level than it is to the adult population. Um, indeed, for those of us in terms of age that are 45 and over, it, it starts to, the, the curve starts to move up. So I know uh, the honourable member would be in the, the category where uh, the risk to him is a lot less than, than, than many within this chamber as well. Uh, so it is felt there is uh, perhaps a little bit of a misconception when it comes to distancing. There is no such thing as a safe distance. There is not safety at one metre, there is not safety at two metres, there is not safety at three metres. But it is about mitigating a level of, of risk. Uh, and as such, I think the first step that we've been able to take has been a movement in terms of the distance uh, down to one. And it is something which now seems to be replicating in, in other areas as well. If we can reach a situation where alternative arrangements and we can have a gear change, which means that we are able to provide um, a different methodology, which means that every child, barring, if you like, the most medically vulnerable, can be in, then I think that that's something uh, that we should be looking to try and make that gear change medically permitting before the end of the summer. I call Jonathan Buckley for something. Thank you. The Minister's approach to date has always been informed by scientific and medical advice. So can I ask, is he aware that the Secretary of State for Education is expected to announce that uh, pupils in England will not be expected to adhere to social distancing while in school and the current bubbles of 15 can be increased to include entire classes? Has the Minister had an opportunity to view or request the medical advice which has informed this decision? Well, directly speaking, obviously, we're fairly degree of con constant contact with um, all the departments of education th uh, throughout both the rest of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. Look, it is the case that in terms of bubbling, I think, will play a critical role. I think it would be deep, clearly accepted by um, certainly the vast majority of medical people from a practical point of view, particularly if you're dealing with very young children, that the concept of, for example, five and six-year-olds socially distancing from each other um, is a certain level of, of, of fiction in, in that regard. Uh, and therefore, I think the bubble um, scenario represents, I think, a very good way forward. Now, judgments in terms of what can be done within schools, we are looking to what will happen in August and September and beyond. Uh, clearly, we're not quite at that point. So there's got to be the issue of how this is viewed through the broader medical situation in the community um, scenario. I, I think we are on a very good trajectory as regards um, as regards to that position, and I believe that um, this will lead, I think, to different ways of being able to provide that level of, of safety. And we should remember that even issues around social distancing, I think one of the things that has happened um, in terms of COVID, at times we've got very hung up on specific measures, um, if you like, the means to an end rather than the end. The end is about ensuring that we have proper protection uh, for all our people. And I, as things move on, I think that some of that will change. And I hope to see a situation in the very near future where we can have that full return to school, albeit with a range of mitigating measures to be able to provide that level of protection. I call Sinead Innes. Gourmet, uh, last hand, call you. Um, Minister, difficulties in relation to the level of access some children and young people have to appropriate IT equipment um, for learning uh, and internet connectivity have been raised consistently with, with you over the last number of months. And the Minister previously stated that work would be undertaken to uh, procure laptops for every child and young person who needs them for, th for this academic year. Can I ask the Minister for an update on this work? Well, there has been, we, we talked about this in three stages. So the first stage was actually those devices that were effectively within the system. And I think there was initially, when, when you go back to the sort of March, Easter time, uh, perhaps a misconception that some of the devices within the system that schools had, that if you simply took them out of school, they, they wouldn't be, if you like, compatible with um, what could be done at home. The, the system is one that can actually be adapted very quickly by C2K. So those have been, um, have been starting to be lent out. The, there was also, I think, around about that stage, a consignment that had been procured by the Education Authority. Those are starting to roll out, having spoken to a school principal this morning, who gave indications that within, for instance, their primary school, they had already identified, indeed, were handing out 
some of those devices this week. And then as part of that, uh, the department uh, will be procuring additional devices as well. That, I think, should give a relatively comprehensive coverage in terms of the devices. Where I think is a more difficult situation, and um, in terms of solution, it is perhaps limited uh, to call it sort of more old-fashioned methods. There, there will be some parts of the country that geographically you could give the best possible device, but if the broadband connection is not there, if there is not that level of internet coverage, it, it will be a very limited value. So schools will know where those, those, uh, those areas are, and I think have been working and will continue to work as fallback options in terms of sometimes paper packs will be needed uh, because um, while sort of there will be certain things that will lie under my control, certain things that I can try and influence, the extent to which I can influence broadband coverage throughout Northern Ireland uh, may be um, in all aspects entirely beyond my level of control. So I think the aim is to try to ensure that all pupils are covered, but of course then the best possible solution is if we can reach a point where actually a large amount of home learning isn't actually needed because the children are directly in, in school. I call Sinead Ennis. Um, and I thank the Minister for his, his response there, um, because I know it personally across South Down I've been contacted by a, a, you know, a widespread of parents who are adversely affected by not having access to adequate um, IT equipment. And I just want, you know, can the Minister give a guarantee that those parents who need it, those children who need it, will have, have that equipment um, by the end of August? The, the aim is to have everybody covered in relation to it. What we find in terms of doing surveying of schools um, was, I suppose, while there will be some schools will have raised the issue of internet coverage, and there will have to be, then, as I said, different solutions to that. Um, it was relatively rarely that it was a question of, within a household, there was no devices. It was the fact that, that where you had a pressure of multiple members of the family perhaps pursuing either one or two devices within that, and that's where the degree of targeting um, will take place. We will do roll out as quickly as possible. There has been, in terms of the provision of devices, there has been a, a form of, of, um, uh, of structure put um, in which priorities have been given to those children that particularly are doing, for instance, year 12, year 14, where they're doing that side of things, where there's vulnerable children. You know, there is a range which we're then trying to work through in terms of the lending of those devices. From a financial point of view, the level of capital investment is not something which is unlike maybe some other things within this crisis that should be eye-watering. So I think it should be something that's able to be met and we're committed to doing that. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And for the record, I would declare that I'm on the Board of Governors of Priory Integrated College in Hollywood. Um, can I ask the Minister uh, why 285 children with statements of special educational need are still without a place for September? I think from that point of view, there is within each year, there is always a level of disjoint between those who have applied and um, the, the places that are available. And this year it is much greater uh, than in previous years. I think there has been at times a dysfunctionality within some of the placement side of it. We're working, as I said, um, I've been here, the executive, but my officials have been working today and this was planned before uh, any of the knowledge on the numbers broke. Uh, I've been meeting today with the um, Education Authority with the aim of taking whatever actions are needed to help uh, resolve that. There will always also be a slight degree of disjoint because you will find some particular locations that are completely full. There may in some occasions be a situation in which a place has been offered to a parent, but the parent is not happy with the offer that they are, that they are given. So it's not always just as quite straightforward as the fact that there's been no offer in connection. With it. And the opportunity for a level of variability, particularly depending upon um, the nature of, for instance, a unit to which uh, a child may be going into is there's a lot less flexibility within that than there is within the normal school system. Because I'm sure as the member will be aware, uh, as we've seen, for example, in a number of years in, in North Down, where there has been a situation in which the demand for places has outstripped the potential supply, there is then a greater level of flexibility within mainstream school placements to have, for instance, temporary variations. But if you're operating to a specific special needs unit, which is effectively restricted to, for example, 15 pupils, there is not the opportunity to, to put in an extra couple of pupils. There's, there's no, there isn't that level of flexibility. But look, the numbers are unacceptable, and as a department, we're working with EA, who've got the operational responsibility for this, to try and make sure that that problem is solved and solved as quickly as possible. I call Andrew Muir. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. But what responsibility does the Minister take and his department take for this failure of area planning for children with special educational need? I certainly accept that it's a, an area planning um, issue. Look, there has been a combination, indeed, uh, concerns were raised. There has been a report that has been done into the functioning of the EA as regards special educational needs. It has made recommendations. Those recommendations are being implemented. I think the problem has been, one of the problems has been that in terms of making corrective changes, um, as with a range of things, there has been an extent to which has that been able to be done as quickly and as well as it would normally be done? No, because across a range of things within government, the shift has been to dealing with the immediate crisis uh, of, that is faced by COVID. And that has meant that not all the things that could be done are being done as quickly as they could be. But it is clear that, that this uh, represents uh, an ongoing need to provide a much more systemic um, challenge in terms of special educational needs. We are also working, I suppose, uh, in terms of, of guidance. And we are conscious of the fact, particularly facing into uh, August, September, that there will be particular challenges that will be there for special education uh, needs children, particularly as regards schools. And so, consequently, in addition to the general guidance that has been provided to schools, there is bespoke guidance that will be, a, be is being made available to special schools, where the special schools principals have been working alongside us. Uh, the latest position, I think, is that that is currently being reviewed by PHA to make sure it is fit for purpose from that point of view. And that guidance, I think, should be issued fairly shortly, particularly to, to special schools, so that we can actually make sure that for all our pupils we get things right uh, for this autumn. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement and all his efforts in, in recent times over the, during the, the COVID crisis. Um, I think we all uh, endorse what has been said about uh, recognising the good work of teachers, especially those schools that have kept open for uh, the key workers' families. Minister, in relation to the challenge of transport to schools, I'm sure it's something you've worked on. Um, have you considered uh, how you're going to uh, transport children to schools. I appreciate TransLink have a responsibility, but you also have a fleet of yellow buses that you have responsibility for. How are we going to fit the children into these? And have you thought about the use, perhaps, of sanitizer or some mild form of protective equipment? Well, look, I think it, it will be a case that um, that hygiene will be critical to that. And I think that for buses as a whole, I think there will be issues around much more frequent levels of, of, of cleaning. We are working with the Department for Infrastructure. We are working with TransLink in relation to it. And um, in terms of particularly some of the mitigations that can be done in terms of public transport as being an issue which is live to the, the executive, we're working to try to resolve those issues. It is clear that unless we get over those issues, that will create a level of pressure that is there in terms of uh, school transport. I think we need to look at where we can mitigate, but try and get, ensure that we get the maximum number uh, on. It, it is undoubtedly the case that in terms of children that they, they don't create the same level of risk uh, as adults will be, and I think that's something also to be taken into consideration as well. And whereas I would anticipate that come any school year, it is likely, I think, next year that there will be some level of shifts in terms of behavioural aspects in terms of travel. Um, I know, uh, I'm sure many members, including myself, would like to see much more active travel to school, but in practical terms, the vast majority of additional travel will be uh, through children probably being transported by their parents. I think there will be some level of shift within that. But we've got to make sure that we get as much a level of alignment of what provision is made through school transport uh, to what is needed as possible. And I'm allowing Gordon Dunn a brief supplementary. Thanks, Deputy Speaker. You're very generous. And thanks, Minister. Uh, have you looked at alternatives in relation to alternative suppliers of transport, Minister? And as you've said, it is important that children are transported in a safe and hygienic environment. I think the only restriction that is there, largely speaking, with um, alternative suppliers is that I think the volume within the market will be such that that would add a certain level of easement to the situation. In and of itself, I don't think it's the solution, because I don't think that the, the volume that would be available out there could meet any sort of the anticipated need. Look, I think there is also a wider issue which um, the executive needs to take into place, because if we end up with a situation that in terms of transport in general, but particularly for children, that there is a particular 
level of restriction on how many people, for instance, could be on a bus, that will have major implications, not simply for schools, but the wider economy as well, which is why I think there needs to be an executive-wide uh, solution to this. And I think it is something that, that uh, if I speak for my colleagues, that, that, that the executive is very cognizant of and is working hard to try and find solutions to. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, last kind of argument. Um, I'm sure the, the Minister will be conscious that, uh, of Mr Buckley's advice around Mr Williamson's social distancing in schools in England. Uh, it would appear from Tory media reports that Mr Williamson will be facing social distancing from the Cabinet by the autumn, so I would caution you on taking that advice on board. But I would like to ask in terms of children with profound special educational needs and summer schemes and summer activities for those pupils. Could the Minister outline what consultation there has been with uh, parents, pupils in that sector? The Department of Health, the Education Authority and the Department have been working closely on that and trying, if you like, to scope out what can be done, because it's also what is doable by youth workers. Uh, I think uh, while there's been, for instance, reference to what's happened in the Republic, some uh, of that has been maybe a little bit overspun, I think would be the, the circumstance. I think I want to see the maximum amount of of summer scheme support that can be made available uh, to that. I mean, I don't know if the, uh, the member uh, also when he was talking about social distancing from the cabinet is offering to uh, swap jobs at the moment uh, in relation to that or whether he feels he's well enough out of it at, at, at the moment. Uh, but look, in terms of advice, uh, we will look always as well, not simply to, for example, where there's advice happening from England, but looking to different jurisdictions. I think one of the advantages that we've had uh, through the fact that we are not just in a position to implement everything is actually to learn lessons from, from outside. And for example, the importance of bubbling has actually been something which has been used fairly extensively in a number of countries in, in Europe. Now, I'm not going to become a, a Europhile all of a sudden, but we can all learn lessons from different parts of the world. And I think it is about actually having that maximum level of knowledge and be able to apply, and also at times where actually particular things are done elsewhere, which don't have a particular applicability to Northern Ireland. We do have our own unique circumstances as well. Call John O'Dowd for something. Uh, I, I can assure the minister I don't envy any of the minister's roles at the moment, and, and I wish you all well. Uh, would the minister be hopeful that there will be provision for children with special education needs over the summer? There will be. I think it will not be to the same extent um, as has maybe been there in previous years. As the same, I think, with other youth service availability, there will be a level of restriction caused by coronavirus. But we're working through, as I said, uh, through. Department of Health, Public Health, EA will all be pulling together and trying to coordinate as well with the schools as to what can be done, what provision can be, can be made. I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And thank you, Minister. Can I uh, quickly pay tribute to the Education Authority youth workers, especially my own constituency of Lagan Valley, who have adopted quickly to uh, provide services and support to children online. Uh, there has been some fantastic engagement in these difficult times, and these workers deserve our thanks. I am concerned about the Minister's comments about the impact of the transport services, particularly on those children with uh, disabilities. And I know the Minister, and I ask the Minister uh, to keep a very close eye on this and to make sure the, that it impacts as little as possible. I thank the Minister for his clarification on social distancing and protective bubbles. However, given the ad hoc way the Executive has been making decisions on the relaxing of restrictions, what assurances can you give to teachers and principals that they won't have to work through the summer to put these arrangements in place only for the executive to change their mind come September? What I would say is there needs to be a level of preparation. I'm, I'm possibly judging that um, uh, the member may, may also be adopting a one metre rule from um, the people before profit in terms of, in terms of distance. It doesn't seem quite uh, sufficiently distant in that, in that regard. But look, from that point of view, I think we have to prepare for all eventualities on that basis. I, you know, I take on board the point that, that has been made. Uh, look, I think if we reach a situation in which we can make a gear change before um, and indeed given the fact that we are two months out from the, really the start of, of term, um, you know, we can't do everything absolutely 100 per cent at this stage on it. You know, I would say if, if despite whatever preparations are being done in terms of the current situation, I think, first of all, the vast bulk of those preparations will apply in all circumstances. So, for example, if there's actions about how you, at primary school, create a bubble situation, how you create, I think, as a school I was at talking about, sort of base classrooms where effectively the teachers move around rather than the, the pupils, 
arrangements around hygiene, arrangements around trying to um, make sure that the levels of un unnecessary interaction don't happen, arrangements around what you do in terms of school meals, arrangements around which will be different from school to school, of what the precise drop-off and collection arrangements are, how you maybe discourage parents, for instance, from being in reception. All those things, I think, largely, un until we reach a point at which COVID is completely behind us, will be there irrespective of whether we have two metres, one metre, or a different form of social distancing. And can I say, whereas it may mean that we reach a point at which some of the work gets overtaken by events, I, look, I would say teachers, parents, uh, pupils, everybody will be in a position, I think, that they will welcome a scenario if safely we can move to a point uh, at which we are able to resume something that is a lot closer to normal. And so, therefore, if people feel to some extent some of their work will then have been unnecessary, I think it will be in a benign manner, which essentially says, actually, we're able to move forward for everybody's benefit. And I think that's something that will be welcomed by pretty much everybody. I call Alan Chamber. Minister, I appreciate uh, that you've been faced with uh, many difficult challenges during this uh, pandemic, uh, as indeed have our uh, dedicated professional... There are no points of order at the committee. Uh, or ask of having a committee in approximately one hour. We regularly go over it. I allow some flexibility. But in order, in order to do so, I need your cooperation. I indicated right at the start, I've indicated a number of times that if you have a long preamble, there will not be a supplementary question. And I've, I've called that on a number of members. And there's a choice for members. If they have a long preamble, they will not get a supplementary question. I call Alan Chambers. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I'll start again. Minister, I appreciate that you've been faced with many difficult challenges during this pandemic, as indeed have our dedicated professional educators. I acknowledge with gratitude uh, the work that has gone into confronting these challenges. My question, Minister, is that human nature will dictate that some children will have worked harder than others at home during this period of school closures. Also, some will have received more parental support than others. And indeed, the sad reality is that some children will have received no parental support during these closures. Will schools have systems in place to gauge exactly where each child is in relation to their education needs on the return to the classroom? And will teachers have the time and opportunity to fill any gaps that they identify? Thank you. The, the point, I suppose, is that, that uh, threefold. First of all, I think that schools will be in a good position to assess where their children are. And to some extent, we can make um, potential presumptions at this stage, but we will not know precisely until we see the lie of the land when children do re return in the autumn. In terms of the level of catch-up, that will obviously be reflected within the curriculum. And that's why, to some extent, it's about returning this to maybe a little bit to the basics of the curriculum. But also, where possible, I mentioned about specific interventions through uh, Engage, and indeed there's a couple of smaller projects we're looking at over the summer as well, which are more limited in their scope. So it will be a combination of those, those measures. But it is undoubtedly the case that, that um, you know, there will be different pupils will be at different stages, different pupils will have received different levels of support, and we've got to do all that we can uh, to help pupils as much as possible do that catch up. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, in your statement, you say you reiterate that £12 million has been there's a £12 million emergency package for the childcare sector. I believe the Education Committee heard this week that only £700,000 of that money has been dispersed. Um, is that right? And can you give an indication of why that is? Is it that the criteria was too tight? Well, I think it's a common thing. I mean, broadly speaking, there is still some money being processed as part of this. And indeed, we won't know the final figure until a little, bit, a little bit later. It has actually been, I think, that in terms of an indicative of a range of factors, in part because actually a range of the childcare settings have been receiving other levels of financial support from other sources, and therefore, in some cases, either not needed or that has seemed to be a less cumbersome route. 
Uh, I think undoubtedly the, uh, the methodology that was used uh, did probably put off some people in connection with it. But I think, it's a, I, think I would say principally there's a level of a need for greater level of alignment um, of, if you like, the supply and demand side of it. So if, for example, it is too restricted in terms of key workers, and there was a problem particularly at the start that the Department of Health uh, their definition of a key worker was on a much narrower basis than the rest of the executive, which meant then that, that those parents who could avail of the service were more limited. And consequently, um, even with a level of financial support for some, uh, for some schools, sorry, some, for some childcare settings, whether it then made financial sense for them to open on a very limited basis was limited. But it's also the case that in terms of the closed settings, because they're effectively would not be a, a form of, of double payment. Uh, some settings found other schemes as either being more lucrative or ones that actually were providing that level of support. So it's, it's about actually adapting the system and actually making sure in terms of recovery that we, we are widening out the, the system, therefore, to try and have that level of alignment between what parents need, what the economy needs, between supply and demand on that basis. I call Matthew Toole for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. But just on, on those numbers, the, the statement says 46% of closed set, only 46% of closed settings applied. But if 700,000 has just been dispersed, that's only a little more than 5% of the, of the overall number. What's going to happen with the rest of that money, particularly given the childcare sector is in crisis? Is it just going to be sucked back into the centre? I suppose, strictly speaking, any money on spent has to be directly surrendered into the centre, but there's a, an additional bid that's been put in to carry things on beyond June. So there will be, I think, I suspect, whereas this will be a, a, something that's beyond simply my control in, in connection with, I think there will be a level of uh, recycling of that money to make sure it's available. What we need to do is make sure resources are available to meet the demand that, it, that is out there. And, you know, mention has been made, for instance, of the uh, closed settings. The closed settings, by their nature, because they were closed, got a level of support. Um, you know, I, I have also, albeit that it was a lower percentage than, uh, than had been hoped for, for a number of those settings, the message that has certainly come back to me via others has been, in some cases, that has effectively enabled that setting to keep its head above water and be in a position that, when we see more of an opening up of the, the childcare setting, to be able to resume. So I think while the level of money that's been spent has been disappointing, in many cases it has made a very significant difference uh, to uh, the provision in a number of cases, and will leave the childcare setting settings in a better position to be able to resume uh, as things open up as, and as the economy opens up. I call Rachel Woods. I'll get straight to it as I would like a supplementary. I'll pick up on Mr McNulty's question. Is the Minister confident that the Executive will sign off on the continuation of free school meals payments before next week, the 30th of June, and therefore has a decision been made about this? The Executive, from that point of view, is, is um, meeting at the moment. Um, I'm not in a position under the uh, situation as regards confidentiality of the executive to discuss precisely what has been there. But what I would say is there is all party consensus on this issue, from those, I suppose, as well, from both outside the executive and inside the executive. So I think there's a strong will to do this. Uh, from the point of view of the timing of this, it would be likely that in terms of the way that this would be phased, that a payment probably would be done, would be most likely to be done uh, on two instalments throughout, throughout the summer. So, you know, the fact that money would not necessarily be in bank accounts on the 1st of July would not actually be the key determinant. It's, it's actually covering the nine-week period. I think in England they're looking at a shorter period of six weeks to be covered. Uh, the proposals that, that I've put forward to the executive cover the entirety of the summer throughout July and August. Uh, and that will mean, therefore, that uh, I believe that the necessary support will be there. But I, I am confident that the executive will agree that position. Richard Woods for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can clarification have been given that the finances from the Department for Education already given for summer preparation for youth services and summer delivery of projects are not frozen for this year and can be spent? Look, I think whatever is needed to be spent will be spent. The, the fact that in terms of um, if it means that, that there are certain things that because of necessity have to be done on a restricted a certain level of restricted basis may not necessarily mean that, that everything um, will need it to be spent in that regard. And there are plenty of pressures in the system where we can actually try and provide that, that level of support. There is no unwillingness on our part to be able to um, have the, do the maximum amount that is, that is doable during the summer. But you know, if, if there is 
for example, in terms of interventions because of, of COVID, a more limited response that can be done, then you won't necessarily be spending the same amount. But everybody, for instance, in terms of um, the support, for instance, of youth workers continues to be employed and continues to be fully funded on that, on that basis on it. But, you know, there are likely to be, while within the, the COVID crisis across the piece, in some cases there will be much greater financial pressures. There will also be, even for schools, uh, you know, some areas where there will actually be less direct pressure in terms of finances as well. I call Jerry Carr. Uh, thank you, Chair. In um, regards to the re return to school, a sector that is often overlooked, under-supported and underfunded is those children with special educational needs. The Children's Commissioner previously has said there are systemic failures. We have heard of uh, hundreds of people not uh, getting placements uh, for September. What they ask the Minister, what guarantees can he give us that these young people will not be left behind as they were in so-called normal times? No, look, it's, it's important, first of all, as regards to placement, I've indicated we're working with the EA to make sure that that is, is fully in place. Also, in terms of resumption, um, the aim would be to ensure that there is resumption across the, bo across the piece. So, that, for instance, for special schools, and obviously as well, the vast majority of, of children with statements are not directly in special schools, they're also in mainstream schools. But for all those children, the aim is to ensure that those happen at the same time. But also, um, he makes the point, as was a concern, that people would be left behind. That, that's why, in addition to the level of guidance that is there in terms of schools in general, we have had a bespoke strand on special educational needs and vulnerable children within the restart uh, side of it, and while there would be additional advice that will be given specifically for that area, because it is important that uh, the circumstances of every child is taken into account as we move forward um, into the new term. Call Jerry Carl for something. Thank you, Chair. Uh, given, you, given the news that various Irish language uh, playgroups in East Colina have lost out for pathway funding despite meeting the criteria, what assurances can the Minister give my constituents and their family members who use these organisations that they won't have opportunities withdrawn as a result of this decision? And can he explain the rationale for that decision? The rationale for the decision, and, and um, I think we have a former minister who will be able to bear this out. Pathways Fund effectively replaced uh, previous funding of, of playgroups, where I think, to be fair, there was a reasonable level of criticism of the previous methodology that effectively those groups that got it, pretty much it was ring-fenced for, I think it went on year on year for about 10 years, uh, roughly. And it meant that anybody who didn't get that funding didn't have that opportunity to do that. A different system was introduced in the Department of Education, I think, roughly about five or six uh, years ago, where Pathways Funding, there's a block of about three million uh, that is made available, that is on a one-year basis, a rolling one-year basis, and each year any of the, any of the groups apply. And where there is, um, where there, if you like, there is more demand, which there has been, I think, each year, uh, than there is in terms of levels of funding, uh, that the criteria used, which have not been altered uh, since Pathways was introduced in about 2014-2015, where that criteria is used is used then to rank the organisations. Now, one of the products of that will mean that each year there will be some groups that receive funding the previous year that are not ranked high enough um, and will drop out of that system, and other new groups. And there will be a, a sort of a, a situation where groups will go in and out. Now, those are entirely done by officials. There is no uh, ministerial involvement uh, within that, and it will mean that, that some groups, and I know from different constituencies, will have missed out this year. Some groups will have got that, that degree of funding. It is not sector specific in that regard. It is applying the criteria, and the criteria have been exactly the same for the last five years on that basis. Members, I hope you will note that the Minister has been answering questions for over an hour. Some 20 members, some, please take your seat. Some 20 members have placed questions and have covered a wide range of areas. Uh, Mr Little, you wish to speak. Speaker, the Education Minister said I was wrong to say that he has uh, suspended the independent review of education and that I should check the facts. Um, a letter I received on the 18th of May from the Minister states I have temporarily suspended work on the independent review of education. I think it's appropriate that's read into the record. Thank you. The, the member has made his point. I thank members for their cooperation. I have done my best to do so in a fair manner. Speaker, can I just ask a point of clarification in relation to these COVID-19 committees? Is it the case that members uh, are not required to be here for the entire 
statement that a minister issues. Um, because I, I do think there's a courtesy issue here of members being here, members taking the time to come here, as they should, hear statements. We've had, we've, we've had members who have not been here today, didn't hear the statement, came in, asked a question and left before the proceedings concluded. Is that appropriate? Uh, this is a committee, yeah. right? This is a committee. There are no standing orders over the, the running of the committee. And, of course, we're operating in terms of COVID rules where there is a necessity on occasions for some parties to uh, alternate their members in order that others can ask questions. So that does happen, but I am not aware of any rules. Perhaps you should take that issue up with the, uh, the business committee or the speaker, but I am not aware of any requirement. <laughs> order, order, order. Listen, folks, there is no points of orders. This is not the assembly. <laughs> Can you please, can you please, can you please take your seat? I cannot answer. I've, I've been generous in taking a few questions. Very briefly. I asked, I asked if it was appropriate. I didn't, I didn't ask for a ruling on it. It's, I don't think that's appropriate, no matter who the minister is. And the other point I would make is, I didn't walk out because you didn't call me for a supplementary. But if people are sitting here and waiting, waiting to ask questions, and a good call for a supplementary, and people who don't listen to the statement then come in, and get the upper, ask a question on a supplementary when others don't. I don't think that's fair. I can understand the member's concern. I have endeavoured to follow the guidance given to me. Ideally, you should have a single sentence at the start and then ask the question. I stretched a little to try and stop uh, everybody not getting supplementaries, but I have to make a judgment at some point. I've done my best. I hope I've been fair to all sides. I'm sure some people will be feeling sore, but we've had the minister here for over an hour for questions. Uh, and people have had an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Members, item three, you'll be glad to know, is the date, time and venue of our next meeting. We've yet to receive confirmation of any further meetings from the executive of this committee. And as soon as details are provided to uh, the, the uh, committee or the speaker's office, members will be notified. But I would remind members that the next meeting of the assembly is on Tuesday, Tuesday the 30th of June, uh, and also that men ministers may make additional oral statements. A relatively short notice has to be given, so don't just assume that everything that is on the agenda is all that will be there. You do have to watch your, your emails and messages. I, I, and that concludes the meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>